for joining us for today's webinar. Uh, the topic of today's session is Mastering Pump Efficiency and Optimising Energy Consumption. Uh, it will be hosted by one of our long-term resident trainers and consultants, uh, Alex Yates. Um, the presentation will last approximately 45 minutes. There will be an opportunity at the end of the session to ask any questions on the presentation. You'll notice that there is an attendee chat uh, which will be on the screen. If you could put questions into the chat box there, and I said we'll answer as many of those as we can at the end of the session. Uh, just a quick head, a heads up in terms of any technical issues. Normally, just uh, as put a note in the chat there, if you turn off other devices with Wi-Fi connection, or if needs be, restart the, the application, that usually works. Uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to Alex and uh, enjoy the session. Thank you. So thank you very much. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name's Alex Yates. I have worked just as a simple introduction in the areas of pump optimization and pump efficiencies for 30, 35 years. I've been paid for 35 years, I should say, on that basis. And we're really going to run through sort of some of the few key points with regard to mastering pump efficiency, but looking at some of the starting points for why you want to do it, what have we got with our operating costs on that basis? Okay, uh, Robert, next slide, please. Um, fundamentally, with our regard to this, this is effectively a, a, a webinar there. We do provide a great deal of training facilities, both either online or in person, um, or also with regard to yourselves um, yeah, actually in your own, own premises and working through on that basis. Um, but the whole principle of what we're looking to do is to measure operating efficiency and effectiveness of plants to enable the machines to be developed um, from there. If we can just look at the next aspect, please. Um, we cover on this one a series of training slides that will run through from pump fundamentals. Pump fundamentals is absolutely it. Where we begin when we look at sort of rotor dynamic pumps, we look at positive displacements and we take the machines through from there. That then is the bedrock which we then build into selection. Testing, testing is a particularly important aspect with regard to understanding the machines, systems, uh, pumping systems, then into hydraulic design, repair and maintenance, and a full hands-on interactive course that deals with testing and assessing plant for their machines. Okay, next slide, please. So generally, with regard to this webinar, what I wanted to sort of touch on in, in this, is to this webinar is to really look at pump efficiency, operating costs, and areas where you can think about optimizing the plant and where you can get support from that to develop the, the need for yourself and for your businesses. So. We're going to start at energy costs. We have all massively suffered, potentially, with regard to energy costs over the last couple of years. Um, I think it's not necessarily that energy is particularly expensive, because in long-term relationship, it's not. What it has been the problem is that energy has gone up aggressively over a sort of a 300% increase in the last couple of years. Um, pump efficiency is one of the experts there. We're looking at things such as refurbishment, we'll look at the pump operating envelope, we'll look at pump types and efficiencies and some of their efficiency boundaries on that basis. So we're going to touch on all of these aspects that are of importance with regard to machines and how to maximise the performance from the machines. Uh, next slide. So I hope that the intention with this the, the, from here that you should be able to at least understand the energy costs associated with pumping. It is a lot. Understand pump performance and efficiency on there, be appreciate, get some appreciation of where with the pump efficiency we can optimize and also look to where we can substantially reduce the operating costs and finally where to go next on that as the, the basic objectives. But the main principle is understanding your operating effectiveness of your machine, but also is that actually correct to start off with? Next slide, please. So machines. You know, what do we use pumps and, you know, how much do the pumps uh, do for the cost of use? OK, a machine fundamentally is going to cost 90 to 95 times the capital in energy terms than the capital cost of the machine. So the focus is really on how do we utilize that, that aspect of energy? And this is a starting point. These machines here are just a couple of small machines I tested in the last couple of years. And they account for quite sizable sales, um, sales of electric motors of between 25 to 35 percent of all electric motors are associated with pumps primarily. So we move it forward from that basis. Next slide. So 
generally, when we start to look at this in a very global overseeing point, we look at the amount of energy that's used. So generally, 70%, 60 to 70% of all electric motors are used for moving of liquids, fluids and gases. So we're looking for pumps, fans, compressors on that basis. But generally, these machines are large. As a result of the mean large, we are using of electrical power. I'm not even counting diesel or other methods of driving motor, of driving pumps. Over 20% of all of the world's electricity is used in pumping. And 50%, 30 to 50% even in water is generally wasted. If we go into certain industrial applications, we could be talking 60, 70%. So there's a whole spread of operating effectiveness and efficiencies for pumping systems when you get down to what we call the true ultimate goal of what the objective is, is transferring liquid from A to B, or from A through a process and back in a closed loop system back to A. And when you start to really look at some of these requirements within here, we then start to see where we can go to optimize and improve operating effectiveness of machines. Next slide. So when we start to look at some of these on these key points for operating costs and so forth, generally US, 25%, Euro European Union, 20% on power, rest of the world, 50%. It is moving, it is changing over the point. But generally, pumps are consuming large amounts of power and the way that it's split around the world. Next slide, please. So when we start to break down our machines and when we start to look at them, we start to really look at what is the true cost, the true operating cost of machines. So between water pumps, process pumps in there, we have a little bit of variance between operating costs, energy and maintenance in that aspect, because we generally water utility machines generally are much, much larger. OK, they're also large in refineries, they're also large in power stations, but across the board, the largest machines, not necessarily the largest, but the, the, the sweep of large machines are generally across water industry applications. Um, when we come down to the last one, wastewater, there is, a, there is a, a labor or manpower aspect in there, which is to remove and keep those machines de-ragged. Um, de so there is a bit of labor associated with them. But fundamentally, your energy is 95% or 87 odd percent or 63%. It is still by far the largest contributing element into some of this aspect. So energy is a, a large a large cycle. Um, I've also put on this on the slide, you know, who sold the first aspect of energy efficiency? Now, nothing is new in this game. First person selling plants on energy efficiency, ultimately, you may have called it something differently, was James Watt. We're talking 250, 260 odd years ago, where machines were sold because his change of steam engines were deemed more efficient than the previous elements of it. So we're looking at optimization and trying to reduce energy. And it has been a an long and ongoing struggle over several hundred years. Um, next slide, please. So when we start to think about energy in energy terms, generally at current rates, whether you're paying in cents or in dollars or in euros or whatever it's going to be on that, uh, that basis, starting with roughly 30 pence a kilowatt hour for industrial consumption, one kilowatt hour having a bar heater on for one year completely will consume over two and a half thousand pounds or dollars or euros of money on that basis. So 10, 10, a 10 kilowatt machine, 26,000. 100 kilowatt machine, 261,000 pounds a year on that basis. Of course, countries will have different aspects of energy. But the point is, when we start to look in at this, the vast majority, when you look in, in the States and the European Union, the vast majority of countries are paying of operating costs above 25 pence or cents a kilowatt hour. And so therefore, we need to start seriously thinking, what do we do to work on these machines and optimize them? These are costs per year. You're going to run a machine probably for 10, 15 years, okay? On a duty standby, you'll take that out to 25 years. But 100,000 hours is your normal running cost. And in that aspect, a 100 kilowatt machine over 100,000 hours of operation is just about touching three million pounds. It is far greater than the capital cost of the actual machine to start off with. Okay, next slide, please. So 
I've talked about the problems. Fundamentally, the problems are how are we going to now look at this plant to see where we can test machines, where we can understand their characteristics and where we can start to develop these machines and these performances into enhancing the characteristic of the machines. So generally, when we start with these machines, we look at the areas of where we can physically save money on the application. There is some work that was done by um, American Department of, uh, of Energy, uh, as well as other energies. But one of the aspects is what is the objective? What are you actually trying to, tr to achieve? Are you trying to transfer liquid from A up to a high elevation? And what is your losses? So we need to appreciate what is the physical objective and how are we actually doing that and where are our inefficiencies within them? When we also talk about pumping, we also talk about pumping with regard to a couple of other aspects, such as machines are compromises. Pumps are an absolute compromise. There is not yet for large scale machines, 3D printing that will let you have a correct machine for your application. So that when you select a pump, you are looking to select a pump that will sit within a pumping characteristic and within a pumping range. I will cover that a little bit later as we go through. But when we start to look at our operating costs of our plants in here, we have our, our several area, key areas of function that we're looking at. One, optimization. Are we actually using the correct pump or the correct pumps out of our, our suite of machines to deliver our objective? General savings on those sort of areas, 175 to 20% in that sort of region on optimization. More with variable speed, a little bit less with fixed speed. Pump condition. So over the, all the, the years that I've worked in this field, um, personally, I've tested around about two and a half, three thousand pumps. I have reported and reviewed over 15,000 tests worth of data. Average shortfall in pumps is, jammed, is between 12 to 14 percent. So 12 for water, 14, 15 for waste on those sort of applications on there in those sort of regions. And it will vary a little bit with other industrial applications. Variable speed. Now, variable speed is defined as the good and the bad and the ugly. We will talk about a bit of a simple example on variable speeds later on, where it has a problem with both the fact the pump is in a good condition, but there are still significant savings to be achieved by running the machines correctly rather than incorrectly. So we're looking at savings that can be achieved on variable speed. We're looking at sort of 10% savings in those areas. Next areas, we start looking at with regards to the elements of the refurbishment, or not the refurbishment, of the correct selection of the machine. No technologies have moved. In a couple of minutes, I'll start talking about the differences of pump type impellers, the difference between radial and mixed. The most efficient machines are at the cusp between radial and mixed flow with regard to pump specific speed. And as a result there, changing machines from very large diameter radial to machines to into multi-stage machines has got a financial benefit, probably in the region of 4 to 5% generally on most applications. And then finally, we're looking at sort of checking and changing that we've got the correct machines, uh, not the machines, but we're looking at running our tariffs. Have we got any flexibility in tariffs? Can we look at using load shifting to move our fluids at low operating costs? It may not necessarily be good for the machine, but for energy, it is optimised on that basis. So we have to think about this. And it does come back to when I've said pumps are a compromise. We have to look at balancing our overall objective of transferring liquid from A to B in the most cost effective manner that we can do. So these are some examples from also the water sector. As I said, I've worked in a lot of water other industries as well as oil and um, other general industries. And the whole aspect is looking to see how you can optimize that plant to deliver the savings that are required without falling foul or causing problems with regard to how that is delivered and how the application affects the, the customer's outcome. Next slide, please. So when we start to look at our mastering of pump efficiency, we'll start with some of the fundamentals. And it's always a big decision between whether you're going to look at the pump first or the system first. Well, let's start with looking at the pump characteristic here. Ultimately, the pump characteristic outlines uh, for a rotodynamic machine. We will classify our data with regard to pump head, 
versus flow rate, shaft power and input power against flow rate, pump or overall efficiency also against flow rate. Um, we also will cover a few things like MPSHR. I've not included that on the curve because it's a, a, a bit of a separate topic, topic and we I cover that in great detail later on. Um, but we look about things about some of these characteristics. When you then start to plot your operating point and your operating machine against an original OEM characteristic, you can start to understand some of the changes that are taking place within the machine. We're looking to see whether we have got a initially one a deterioration in performance this curve is showing a machine that's got around about 14 percent deterioration in performance at its best efficiency point i.e the the the, the, the peak of the, of the efficiency curve it also if you then look at the top curve the difference between the in-service and the oem characteristic now when you look at the profile of the in-service curve compared to the OEM curve, you can look to appreciate and understand what some of the operating degradations are, whether it is clearance, whether it is um, frictional loss inside the machine, it's gonna be a combination of most of them, but you, need, you can get an indication of what sort of remedial work we need to deal with when we change on this. Now, it's also shown on the curve in here, in black on the middle curve on power, it shows effectively that the power curve appears to increase. It hasn't increased, it is translated back to the left. Power doesn't necessarily increase, it doesn't go down either. So we're looking at our power curve has translated back to the left on its curve, which gives us effectively a separation between the measured data and the observed data at the, at the starting point. Now, using pump efficiency, you can do an awful lot looking at its starting characteristic. But if you want to take this a little bit further, you have the next slide, please. We want to then be able to plot this data and look realistically at the system. The system determines everything. The system characteristic is the key element that is going to determine what they are looking and how things are working on this basis and how things are going to operate in the system. So system resistance is a really, really key feature. Now, when you have your system resistance characteristic, once you start with your system curve, if you are going to replace or refurbish a machine on there to reduce its operating costs, we need to understand the true operating envelope that the machine will go through. So in this case, I've plotted three straightforward, simple curves. All of them go through the same point. So they go through 285 liters a second, 43 meters set. It doesn't matter realistically quite what the head is, but we just use this as our as our reference point. Now, in this case, I've shown three sorts of three typical curves through the application. One, closed loop. Closed loop generally, not always, but generally, is for heating and for cooling. That's its normal application on that application. If you're on closed loop heating circuits or closed loop cooling circuits, we're going to be taking a liquid from A through a process and back to the, our starting point again, A on there. So all of the losses are friction. If I go for the green curve, well, the green curve effectively shown for large diameter transfer mains on this case, there is its static is what, 40, 41 meters. In this case, its frictional component is is very small, two meters in there, or we're talking probably about 5% of the system curve. And your actual starting point for how you are going to either rehabilitate or replace your machines to fit on the application is quite important on that basis for, for when you're going to run your machines on that. Uh, the blue curve, general, general transfer load, giving you roughly a sort of a 20%, 25% variation in system characteristic at the run at the duty point, simply to relate to the performance of the machine. So when you look at all of these machines on this sort of basis, and you look at these system curves, it does start to give you some in, independence or some thought rather, in how you can use these machines to run together and how you can use these machines to run their characteristics so that you can deliver operational savings on the systems. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, 
So what I've got here on the slide is looking at the next three slides are effectively the effects of combined system performance and system operation. So this curve has got a reasonable amount of detail, but we'll we'll start to explain this as, as, as we go through on this on the starting point. So this is a simple curve comparing operating efficiencies for solo, shown in yellow, red for two pumps in parallel, blue from measured field data. So this was a case of monitoring the pumps for a period of time, in this case around about a week and a half, to look at operating profiles to show how the machines are starting to change. Now, initially, your first starting point is, why am I using two pumps? That should be your absolute first question, because it does mean that in reality, the operating machine is being restricted in its capacity. Its performance is down in the region of the low 60s, 50s to 60s in its operating efficiency. That will have a significant degradation on the pump's operating performance. It will have a serious degradation with regard to the condition of the machine inside there. So both A, you're reducing the operating performance. B, you're physically reducing the efficiency of the machine. C, you are going to reduce the operating life of that machine. So you are having to repair this machine far more regularly than you would do if you had operated this as a solo operating machine. And part of the problems with this is how the PLC has been set up in order to deliver the operational saving, to deliver the operation on the station without an appreciation of what it is actually doing to the machine. Sure, it is delivering the flow rate that is required from the machines, 130, 140 litres a second. That's what it's delivering. That's fine. But what it is not doing is looking to see where you should have your switch points from solo to parallel. In this case on the site, there is little reason for it operating in parallel on the, on the basis. There are a few occasions during the year where you need to run it in parallel, but they are for a one or two week basis. They are not 24 seven on the site. This is a site I've been to numerous times over the years looking to change and re and rechange the PLCs to get this, this aspect changed out on there. But fundamentally on the site, savings, £97,000 savings on the site, relatively simple one, at 25 pence. So it will be a lot more actually as it runs through. The machines are not particularly big. They are horizontal split case machines with a 250 mil suction. They are not particularly large machines on there and still their savings are significant. The problem is not necessarily the pump. The problem is how the machines are controlled. So it's back to one of those small little triangles or, or on the pie chart of where you can achieve operational savings on the site. Next slide. So the way that this was done is we've got a, 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 I've got a monitoring system that will measure across the pumps. So in this case, measuring the pump efficiency by thermodynamics, measuring the change in temperature across the pump. So it measures the change in enthalpy. Um, it also measures the product of the pump not the product of the pump, it measures the losses of the pump. Conventional measures the products, it measures the losses of the pumps. By measuring the losses of the pumps, you have a technique that is several times more accurate than the loss that you're physically measuring. Now, in reality with this, if you're going to use this and do this effectively, we need to think about how most normal sites work. Most normal sites, you will have ammeters, you will have pressure transducers, hopefully on the pump, probably on the mains as well. Then it comes to the tricky one, which is flow. And normally most flow meters that are installed are going to be installed on the manifold. If you try and install a flow meter around a pump, it could be tricky. You may have insufficient lengths of straights. So some of the lengths of straights that you've got to deal with when you start looking at conventional approaches and so forth is, well, where am I actually going to measure and how do I prevent things such as recirculation where the liquid will flow from the discharge of one pump back through a failed or a failing non-return valve and back into the suction. So there's lots and lots of things that need to be considered when you want to assess the performance of the machine. Um, next slide, please. Now, this again is a slight converse of the slide. So instead of plotting pump efficiency this time, we have plotted pumping cost, kilowatt hours per megalitre. How much does that machine actually cost to utilise to transfer the energy or to transfer that liquid from 
effectively a low level reservoir up to a higher level reservoir. This is a, effectively a bulk to bulk. This is a, an A to B transfer on this application. Again, when you look at the curve, the machine, I'll still show the machine is in a very good condition from an operation point of view. It is just not being run particularly effectively. And that is the that is the main issue with this this regard. You are down to that sort of aspect on there. So when you look at some of these things with regard to optimization, not only do you need to look at the pump efficiency, but you also need to look at the operating costs, which comes back to our, our, our whole title, mastering pump efficiency and understanding the optimization and understanding energy optimization. So we need to look at both aspects on here. We also need to remember that whatever we do will deliver a specific and defined flow rate. So we've looked now at the starting point of looking at pump efficiency, looking at a system characteristic, looking at, as a starting point, some of the problems when machines run together on that basis. Okay, next slide, please. So what are we actually looking to achieve? Now, when we start with a pumping system, it is exactly that. It is a system. It is taking liquid from a source through a, a, a machine inlet, through a machine, through the discharge pipeline, and to the outlet. And you need to consider all of those five aspects with regard to the system. However, if you wish to improve it, all that you can do is improve components. And you have to appreciate we have our difference between our component-based system and our total operating system. And we have to make sure that whatever we do on one component, appreciate and understand the impact on the second or subsequent components in the system. Now, what this chart shows for is effectively, we're looking at the energy that you are going to save through there, and also look at what your operating impact will be on there. So simple graphics on this one is looking at the rate of degradation that you will get on a pump over time. And ultimately, the main reason that these, these machines will degrade is that ultimately they degrade simply because we are pumping a relatively heavy liquid. Okay, there's lots of changes of liquid densities, but generally most liquids that are pumped, particularly in rotor dynamics, are going to be between about 0.8 to 1.1, 1.2 on specific gravity on there. So there is a decent amount of mass that is flowing through that machine as it pumps through the liquid. As it pumps the liquid. So we move that through there. That will cause degradation. If you have a well-performed machine that is operating towards its best efficiency point, it will still degrade by half to 1% per year in an ideal situation. And that is a machine that's not even pumping solids or other fibrous or other materials in there that may accelerate that rate of degradation. Okay, so the principle of what we're looking for on this chart is to basically optimize and re-optimize the efficiency drop that you get on a machine. So that's what we're looking to do is to re-optimize the energy efficiency. So as it drops in performance, we look to take the we look to take the pump out. Now looking to take the pump out when our shortfall is between six, seven, eight percent, you are changing bearings, you are changing casing rings much, much easier. If you wait until you sort of get 14, 15 percent down you're probably looking at changing shafts, you're probably looking at doing some significant casing repairs, and you're probably starting to do some repair work on the impeller. So the part of the benefits of optimizing the machine on a more regular basis is that you are actually keeping the efficiency higher, but also you are stopping the other major cost components from being degraded over a period of time. So the whole principle of this generally is A, we're gonna reduce operating costs, B, by targeting the pump on a more systematic and prescribed maintenance and correct maintenance procedure, we are going to improve the resilience of all of the pumping systems. Three, if we do this correctly on this basis, we are also going to reduce the inefficiencies of the plant, improve the overall average efficiency of the plant, and therefore reduce the operating cost of the whole system. So this is a way that we can look at this to optimize the machines and maintain the efficiency and keep it maintained regularly on that basis. Next slide, please. 
So having looked at the problem, having looked at the potential options for solution and repair, we need to think a little bit more about a couple of other things on the machines. So undoubtedly, most of you, when you're looking to select pumps and pump curves, you will have your data that come from a manufacturer. It will show you a manufacturer's curve. It will show you where the pump is running against that manufacturer's curve. It will talk about your defined duty points. It will talk about pump specific speed, suction specific speed, and so forth. It, it also, depending upon the manufacturer, they may give you a POR, preferred operating range, and an AOR, acceptable operating range. And that really defines the boundary of where the pump should be running for the duration of its operation. Now, preferred operating range is ultimately defined by what is our minimum flow coming through our machine and where we're going to have our machine running just a little bit further to, uh, around the machine. So it's normally for a radial machine, minus 10, minus 15%, plus five plus eight percent those sort of regions around there if you run in that region your machine's performance will be not only maintained but at a higher level if you start to move out but also appreciating that if we change from a radial to a mixed these parameters will become squeezed if you change from a mix to an axial it is a very peaky operating efficiency which i'll cover in a minute on that now when we then define aor the boundaries of AOR are basically minimum continuous stable flow to the left of the curve and cavitation point to the right of the curve, neither of which are where you should be running, particularly for any duration of your operation. So although it is deemed as acceptable, um, just because it can doesn't mean that you should. So we need to think about how we run our machines on that. We have very much a clear defined duty point. If we run at that clear defined duty point, great. If we run, or BEP point rather than duty point, if we run a little bit to the right or to the left, that's fine. But the point is the further we move away from our BEP, our BEP or BEQ point, we will cause that machine to both A, cost more to operate, B, will wear quicker. You know, if you were to put almost a pump efficiency characteristic underneath it, not quite that, but we've all seen pump operating costs and so forth, run the machine around POR, you will get the most life from the machine. Run outside it, you will expect the machine to fail. And it's fail reasonably quickly on that, on that basis. Um, so we need to think about a couple of things like this. Ultimately, if you wish to maintain the performance of your machine, we should absolutely be maintaining pump operating efficiency and maintaining the pump operating envelope. Okay, next curve, please. So having said what the problem is, we need to think maybe a little bit about actually how the machines fundamentally work. The way that they fundamentally work on this case, particularly with a rotor dynamic, is exactly that. It will cause the liquid to rotate. So the liquid approaches the pump, comes into the inlet of the impeller. We will drop the pressure inside there. The liquid will rotate. The case of the pump and the impeller, they work, sorry, the, the impeller and the casing, they work together. The whole principle of the impeller is to rotate the liquid. The whole principle of the casing is to collect that rotating liquid and convert it from rotational energy into useful pressure energy. That is the whole principle of the operation and the two are defined together in the way that they operate on this basis next slide please so when we think about that as our starting point when we want to look at mastering pump efficiency on this basis we need to be very conscious of what machine types that we have so i've shown on here three simple machine types i've shown a radial curve a mixed flow curve and an axial flow curve Okay, I've shown three impellers as well underneath. They are not as prescriptive as that. The impeller shapes will generally change as you change for your application. But we start with looking at the data. If we look on the left-hand side with regard to radial, radials will give you high absolute head per impeller. So if you're going to do something like a boiler feed pump, sure, you may have 10, 15 impellers within there, but you're also going to have a machine that's going to do two, two and a half thousand meters pressure inside the machine. If I go to the extremity on the right to axial flows, it has a very low absolute head, three, four meters, possibly five on that sort of basis. But in terms of flow, it will pump large absolute volumes of flow. 
But there is this is where the trick comes into this. We have the case of two points. We have absolute values that are high, but relative changes inside the characteristics. So if you have the relative change of a radial around about your POR range, you might have 15, maybe 20% variation in head. That's it. Whereas on an axial, you could absolutely have a two or three to one change in relative terms of head. We also then have a couple of issues that come through with regard to your pump curve. Selecting a pump for a high static load radials, great. Not going to use an axial, it's not going to deliver it. But radials will be very good because even if the machine runs out to the right, it's only, only, only only ever going to get to radial head, sorry, to the static head. Therefore, the fact that its power curve is still rising will control it. If we start to move into axials, part of the problems with axials, how do you start them? You need to start them variable speed and bring them into a system because their highest power demand is at closed valve. So you don't necessarily want to be doing closed valve direct online. Because what have you sized your motor for? Have you sized it for running regime? Or have you sized it for its stationary off regime on that basis? So we have a couple of them. And then we end up with mixed flows in the middle. And the thing about a mixed flow machine in the middle is although the efficiency curve is slightly compressed compared to a radial, it has a much steeper head flow curve and you have a pretty flat power curve. Okay, it depends upon what we're talking about with our numbers on this one. But generally, you may have a small rising curve to what we call a non-overloading curve, which will reach a peak and then it will dip down. So it will never overload the motor. So both of these aspects, we can look at the motors from the pump and the motor all the way through on the basis. Uh, next slide, please. So when we start to look at mastering pump efficiency, we need to get our appreciations with regards to our aspects. How do we measure it? Measuring pump efficiency ultimately is the relationship between water power to input power into the machine or shaft power into the pump on that basis. So pump efficiency, we calculate that by absorbed power uh, on, the, on the motor and we divide, we divide our fluid power, which is pressure P rho or rho GQH, pressure times gravity times head times flow rate is water power. Divide that through by shaft power on the motor, on the pump coupling on that basis. Overall efficiency. Now, overall efficiency is important because that's what you're paying for, or you're paying for the power in the MCC. And we just need to think that some of our things, such as inverter efficiencies uh, on, uh, on that aspect, can be taken in there. And we need to consider that our overall efficiency or drive efficiency is motor and inverter, pretty common, particularly when we get to an IE5 motor, um, motor and gearboxes, motor and fluid couplings motor and a belt but we don't actually also have to use an electric motor to drive it we can have it driven by a steam turbine or a gas turbine or a pump running in reverse on there or, or a diesel or petrol engine all of them are drivers for our applications next slide so we look really at where we define our operating efficiencies and i will apologize for this on the way that this has got through the slide Power is the deliberate mistake. It should the power lines of red, red, yellow, and green should be over the motor rather than stuck on the on the coupling. Okay, starting with this. So you measure pump performance by two methodologies. We either measure, measure it thermodynamically or we measure it conventionally. If you're measuring it thermodynamically, you need to measure the temperature and the pressure of the of the pump and the electrical power with a machine. Pump's got four parameters: head, flow, power, and efficiency. No three, calculate the fourth. Conventional method, measure flow, measure pressure, measure power, calculate efficiency. So those are the two techniques that are, are used for the assessment of the, of the product on there. So we're looking to use that. But is that really the picture? So if we went to the next slide on, on, on the picture, actually, when we start to really look at the pump efficiencies, we should be looking at system efficiencies as well. Um, this is a machine that I uh, assessed a number of years ago out in um, out in, in, the, um, in the Greater Americas, out in Canada, on there, and it is looking at a machine performance, and I'm comparing pump efficiency, overall efficiency, system efficiency, fluid left to right through through on the suction or the inlet, isolation valve into the large split case machine, out of a pump on the discharge or the outlet through a non-return valve, through an isolation valve 
and also through a control valve, which is the key point on this aspect. So if I'm doing my assessment on the pump efficiency, the pump is 84%. You would expect with that size of machine, considering this is a four megawatt machine, you might be touching 89, possibly 90, but let's, let's I'll hedge my bets and sort of go 89% on that, that sort of machine as peak. So there is a little bit to be gained on the performance of the machine. However, the key issue is what is the pressure, pressure differential between the pump and downstream? So downstream of the control valve, instead of it being 80 meters, or slightly more than 80 meters, it's 60 meters. You're talking of a 25% drop in performance, simply being wasted through one control valve on those machines. In this case, currently, this machine, well, this machine was costing an additional $2.19 million per year to operate, simply because of its control valve on that application. Now, the other aspects of the science also had a couple of smaller machines. They were variable speed, but they were variable speed by a fluid coupling. That is still a break. So although this machine, this, this site was a efficient pump efficiency, the operating efficiency was effectively at best 16 to 63% on the machines, losing a quarter of the power load, at least a quarter of the power load, simply by the control philosophy and the control technologies that were applied to the machine. So just thinking when you start thinking about this, we need to look, absolutely need to look at boundaries and understand, are we just assessing the red pump efficiency or assessing the blue, the true optimization cost, which is what you need to do if you're going to deliver optimization energy savings. Next slide, please. So a couple of simple pumps, we can just look through there. The majority of pumps in most applications are either rotor dynamic, oh, sorry, are rotor dynamic, but they're either radial or they are going to be centric, uh, they're going to be mixed flow on those applications. So mixed flow bottom left, um, uh, end suction radial common workhorse on the top picture, green pump in the middle, double entry split case, uh, pump over on the top right is a, a ring section, variation of the theme. Bottom pump is effectively a BB2 pull out on that basis. Uh, next slide, please. So, some of the things that you want to think about if you're going to really focus this on the energy efficiency and optimization is we are looking to be very careful in the quality of work that has to be done to improve and maintain the efficiency of the machines. So, this is some data from Hydraulic Institute, and it is looking at just improving our clearances on our casing rings. So standard clearances are approximating between 0.3 and 0.5 millimeters, depending upon machine type. Okay, we talk about pump specific speed. I've, um, in this case, this is marked in American units. Basically, the green area is effectively showing the normal operating range of machines you would expect for radio for radials and just touching on mixed flow characteristics, a, few, a little bit of mixed flow characteristics. That's a normal operating envelope that you are going to expect. Okay, so the standard clearance, 0.3 mil. We take that from 0.3 to 0.45 of a mil. So a couple of, maybe a sheet, maybe a couple of sheets of paper. You are going to increase the losses in that machine, decrease its pump efficiency, pretty much from anywhere from four to one and a half percent or six to one and a half percent. That's the total for just a 50% increase in clearance or from 0.3 to 0.45. If you were to go from 0.3 to 0.6, that figure drops in the region of eight, nine, 10% for a very radial machine. And even a mixed flow machine, you're gonna be about three and a half percent on that aspect. So clearances are really, really critical on these machines to maintain performance. The problem you've got, you have to resolve a system problem, but we resolve it by looking at components, pumps and valves and pipes and variable speed. All of them need to be considered all at the same time. Uh, next slide, please. So the last little thing I'm going to cover, really, cavitation. I'm going to cover cavitation in a very simplistic aspect. Cavitation occurs when we have effectively a, vapor, a phase change, both from a liquid to a vapour and from a vapour back to a liquid normal routine on that aspect. When we get it, machines are going to be noisy, absolutely going to be noisy. Um, we have a, 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 high uh, a high frequency vibration of 10 to 15 kilohertz. 
We're going to get pipework that's going to vibrate. We're going to get problems with bearings. We're also going to get the erosion, which is part of the issue. So not only do we physically block the machine by the vapor in there, but as that vapor collapses, it will erode the machine. Okay, I've only shown bronze and cast iron because stainless is corrosion, is resistive to the damage. We will get polishing. We should not get substantial erosion on it. But we need to think about our materials where it occurs. We also need to think where it's going to occur on that impeller. Is it going to occur on the back of the suction shroud, on the suction vane? Is it going to occur at the exit tip or is it going to be recirculation? All of the above occur depending upon where that pump runs and the operating curve. If it's in POR, we're OK. Once we're out of POR and into AOR, then we start to induce cavitation both on the discharge and on the suction of the machine, depending upon where we are running on our curve. Next slide, please. So this is just this is just an example of slides. Uh, it's a couple of pumps that I've done. They are some very simple 35, 37 kilowatt machines that are running on the sites. They are transferring water from a lock into a treatment works. They're not particularly big, but you can sort of see. I suggest that the pump on the left hand side is cavitating and it is cavitating because it has a blocked strainer. The strainer was not maintained. It's got weed and growth across there. It is causing a pressure drop into the machine. The problem with all of this, of course, is when the machine fails is it's the pump's fault. Uh, it doesn't matter which industry you talk to. It's all the pump or the valve or whatever component it is. It's that component's fault. This is, yes, this is showing an example of what actually happens to the machine's characteristic. Is it the pump's fault? Well, the pump is showing a distress, but it is caused because of poor maintenance on the suction side. So when you have these machines, they are not fit and forget. You have to look after them over the time. Even the pump curve on the right is still showing a machine that has is in much better flow conditions because on the left, the pump does about 110, 115 litres a second. Pump on the right for the same head is 170 odd litres a second in comparison. Much higher flow rate from the machine because it hasn't got a block strainer on that basis. But it's still showing some signs of distress. Part of the separation on the right hand part of the curve is a frictional loft due to tubulation and growth within the casing of the machine. The point is this is a relatively easy aspect to remedially repair, but you do have to make the effort to repair it. OK, next slide, please. So generally, in summary, from everything I've talked about for the last sort of 40 odd minutes or so, is when we start to talk through energy costs for pumps, they are 90 to 95 times more than your capital cost of your physical machine. Why are you spending all your time just looking at the capital cost of the machine? It's the operating cost that is critical on this one. We need to understand absolutely how these pumps perform against their operating system curve and what is their operating envelope. How much do the machines run? If you go think back to the picture I talked about when I talked about the machines running two in parallel, they actually run over a substantial flow range on the machine. So they are not a single stationary point. So we talk about that they run against an operating characteristic. What is it? Pumps wear. Even well-selected pumps will wear between half to 1% per year. Run them out of POR, that will go up on that basis. So ultimately, measuring pump performance and system characteristic is absolutely critical to maintaining the proper maintenance of the assets, as well as you do need to do maintenance. We cannot just fit and forget. We have to look after these machines on a periodic basis, two, three, four, five years on that sort of basis. Also, if we can maintain performance while the pump has a shortfall of less than 10%, we will save money. It is considerably cheaper to rehabilitate a machine when it is operating in, in those aspects. Because as I said, you're changing casing rings, you're chasing bearings, changing bearings on that case, you're dressing impellers. You're not having to do a great deal of remedial work on things such as, as shafts or casings. So we have a whole aspect of what we can do to deliver savings. OK, so that's pretty much my run through on the on the course. Um, we do at iMechE offer you options and solutions to deliver this. So we offer in this case is a series of pumping courses that are both in, in, in situ, both in London and online. And of course, we're more than happy to come and talk to 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 users 
specifically on their applications. Um, but otherwise, thank you very much for your time and it's now open to questions. Uh, yeah, thank you, Alex. A uh, couple of questions. I think, to be fair, I think you've a lot of questions you might have covered in the presentation. Um, oh. There's a couple of questions here. The, the first one, I think, was a statistic you came out at the beginning of the presentation uh, in terms of saying that um, pumps consume 25% of the world's electricity. Uh, yep. What's the source of that information? Oh, right. Okay. That is both sourced from UK, uh, from both UK and Euro pump data. Where you're you're getting effectively a collection of pumps on site on 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 size and also comparing that back to it. I can deal that. I can dig that source out as, as aspect uh, later on. The first part of it was shown by data provided by DOE in the states, and part of it is data that I've got from collection of a collection of data that's been collected over the over um, from UK and Euro pump on that basis. I, I assumed it was a, a credible source. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Another question here, also a couple of uh, nice comments coming in saying, you know, thank you, excellent presentation. So obviously well received, which is great. Um, question here from uh, from Stephen. Uh, with the cost benefits of maintaining pump performance, our company is doing this. So that's part one. Uh, and part two of the question is, and if not, what do you see as the biggest barriers to companies realising these benefits? Um, you're asking to release an asset. And it depends upon how tight your customers are on, uh, when I say tight, is in how tight their water resources are in being able to release an asset. Um, that is part of the difference. So you, you always have this balance between resilience and operation. And also, I don't want a pump to fail on me when another pump is away. So part of the things you think about doing on pump rehabilitation is do you have a standby pump booked, not paid for, but booked? So you have an ability to have a machine that comes in there. You also have to have a really tight specification for the delivery of pump rehabilitation. That's the key focus. It's going to be taking on, if you're going to just change mechanicals inside the machine, sensibly you should turn it around in about two, two and a half weeks. If you're going to coat the machine, particularly if you're going to coat the machine for a drinking water application, you've probably got to wait a further 21 days for the epoxies to completely this, uh, come out of the liquid or uh, come out of the the coating basis so to be safe for sanitary use on, on water so you've got a couple of aspects on that but the main disadvantage that you get with some of those main problems you get with this is just organizing and it is an organizational problem rather than an actual mechanical problem in delivering mechanically it's fine it is an organizational problem that's the main thing that stops this happening <sighs> um quick question here. basically I'll, I'll try and summarize this but in terms of um, obviously, how we consume energy and source of energy are changing dramatically as we speak. Yep. In 10 years' time, do you think you'll still be delivering this type of training, this webinar? Do you think there'll be major changes that will be impacted in terms of you know, uh, pump optimization and consumption? Do you think this will this will change um, in 10 years? Um, I'm not certain what changed it either. But in reality, we need to think about uh, the, you know pumps. In some ways, pumps were much better 30, 40, 50 years ago than they are now. We've gone through a whole period of decades of us sweating an asset to the absolute extremity. And pumps are in a much poorer condition now than they would have been even, let's say, 30 years time, 30 years previously on that aspect. Um, also, machines are designed to a cost now. So you're getting machines that have much higher exit velocities than you would do on previous designs. And what have people done with regard to sorting out the system to match the application on, on that basis? So I still think this is going to carry on because actually co companies have poor corporate memory. And um, you're, you're talking about defining this to a person rather than defining this to an organization and recording it. So, yeah, I think this A will carry on. I think technology will help. But if you're going to change a whole organization, um, that's quite a difficult. That's a very tricky application to do. Um, but also what's what's good from my point of view on this one is I can talk about the generics, but actually you need to measure the individually to sort it out. So, yes, it will carry on, but it will carry on into a different thing, particularly within 10 years. Um, 30 years might change a little bit, but pump technology hasn't really moved massively for, for 30 or 40 years on fundamentals. And you comment there saying that 30 years ago, actually, pumps were of a higher quality. What, what's what's caused that demise? Um, cost, operating oh. cost, yeah. simple cost. So by going, if you have a machine that runs faster, it means that the machine is physically smaller. 
If it's physically smaller, you've used less metal, you've used less material, and therefore it's cheaper to, um, to manufacture and sell. Also, manufacturers generally, particularly in particularly in UK and, and, and US on those sort of aspects there, are actually commodity brokers only. They are selling a pump. Um, and also pump companies have gone through massive overhauls themselves. You know, there's no there's no necessarily fault or blame on any of this, but you know, those organizations have had to adapt to the changes of, of businesses coming in. Um, they do not do the whole package anymore. That is part of the problems on that basis. Very good. Um, yeah, I think we've covered most of the questions there then in the presentation. There's a couple of people asking, um, oh, actually, another question here. Uh, a very insightful presentation. Thank you. Do you think that the efficiency of the pump will be greatly affected by the outdoor pressure, for example, at certain heights? Okay. Generally, most machines will be defined up to 1,000 metres. Um, we are looking at relative terms rather than absolute terms with regard to pump efficiency so generally there's a lot of restrictions on most data that will say above a thousand meters you need to go back to a manufacturer for class clarification you are more likely to have far more problems associated with your suction inlet pipe work than i think you will do for elevation on a um, but then again i'm living in a relatively low level country in the uk i don't think we get much above a thousand meters anywhere in the uk That's so true. From that, from 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 aspect in the UK, I don't really have a problem. Other areas, so things in the Himalayas, a little bit more tricky. But I still think that fundamentally, you've got to get your liquid properly and correctly into your machine um, before you uh, before you deal with it. That is going to have far far more impact than an elevation change. I think on that basis. Excellent. That's great. Well, I think we're about coming to the end. So just a, a couple of general questions to answer. Um, Yes, copies of the presentation and the slides uh, and the recording, sorry, will be available and probably email within the next 14 days. Um, the videos, uh, which we've, um, oh, actually, we'll, one more question. Uh, the, the, this is typically coming late now. Quick yes. question. Should we design pumps and pump systems with data tracking so that performance can be analyzed automatically so that maintenance can be done as and when required? Um, I think the correct answer should be yes. I think the realistic and pragmatic answer is you should make the ability of make it available to be done because it is always a case of companies are very good at collecting data. They are very poor at analyzing data in many cases, because when you have thousands and thousands and thousands of data points, how do you collect it all? Well, you collect it all, but you then got to analyze it and analyzing takes time. It does take time. Um, this is probably where I think the biggest thing is going to change is, is into the area of, I'm going to say predictive analytics, some intelligence, some machine intelligence. I'm not even certain about that as a phrase, but some machine intelligence to learn and understand some of these characteristics. Um, but if you're going to collect data, yes, put your, put your sockets on the machine and yes, collect your data. And you should be collecting your data on a pump basis rather than on at a system level. You need to collect it at a pump level, not as a system level. That's the point. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, and I think, yeah, I think that's about it for questions. Yes, I was saying the, the presentation will be uh, issued in 14 days time. We have a YouTube channel which will have this uh, video uploaded to, along with all the previous uh, webinars that we host on various topics, technical, non-technical uh, topics. Uh, the website, www.imbakey.org, is a great resource for information, and there you'll be able to find all the pump courses as well. Um, but again, quick thank you to Alex. Very, a very informative and very well-timed presentation today. It's not easy to cram all that information in within 45 minutes. Uh, thank you for all joining us today. I hope you have a great weekend. And uh, again, a final virtual round of applause for Alex for doing the presentation today. Thank you very much. Really thank you. Really appreciate it.